Welcome, Marcus and Timothy. Thank you, Laura. And hello to our friends internationally. Uh, as Laura told you, I am Marcus Burke, and I'm honored to be here with Timothy Clark, the featured contemporary artist in the, just a moment. Exhibition, American Travelers, a watercolor, watercolor journey through Spain, Portugal, and Mexico that we have in our temporary exhibition gallery, our exhibitions gallery, I should say, through uh, October 16th, 2022. There's only a, a few weeks left for you to see it if you haven't seen it already. The exhibition and its catalog have been made possible by the generous support of Dr. Lisa Dunkel Scheffler, who also lent a picture uh, to the show, Thomas E. Harvey and Kathleen P. Black Foundation, Mary and Sam Miller, Betsy and Leslie Roy, who've also generously donated one of Tim's works to the Society and the New York State Council of the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature, as well as the trustees, donors, and members of the Hispanic Society Museum and Library, to which I should add support for a curatorial fellows from the Rockefeller Brothers um, and from uh, the Queen Sofia Spanish Institute. My co-curators of the exhibition were Orlando hernandez Jean and Alexandra rodriguez Jack. I think you all know me as the now emeritus senior curator in the museum department, but I do want to introduce my co-host tonight, Timothy J. Clark or Tim Clark, as we can call him here among friends, was born in Santa Ana, California in 1951. Tim works in Capistrano Beach, California, in New York City, and in Maine, whence he is coming to us over Zoom. You can see the Maine forest over his left shoulder. Uh, many of you have also met him here in our galleries. His artistic training from 1969 included what may be called both conservatory and academic elements, the former at the Art Center College of Design, which is now in Pasadena, and the Trunard Art Institute in Los Angeles, one of the predecessor institutions of Cal Arts, the California Institute of the Arts, and subsequently in the Art Department of California State, Long Beach. Those of you that know something about 20th century fine arts training may begin to understand in Tim's studies, how an artist with a degree from the now famously radical Cal Arts program could continue to embrace a careful realist aesthetic, not to mention the Baroque touches in Clark's compositions, all in the context of thoroughly modern compositional practice. We'll learn more about Tim's Hispanic connections, but I just want to add that he is in many museum collections and has had numerous exhibitions throughout the United States. And I want to shout out that he recently presented an immensely successful exhibition of watercolors, portraits of jazz musicians and others at Howard University Art Gallery. And it is a great honor for me personally to have him here with me. The inspiration, excuse me just a minute. The inspiration for the Hispanic Society exhibition began with the Society's participation in a 2004 Child Hassam retrospective. A study of that works uh, led me to understand the obvious relationship between Hassam's trip to Spain in 1910 and the Joaquin Sorolla exhibition at the, the uh, Hispanic Society in 1909. Uh, there were also watercolors in the collection. They were not in the exhibition, but it got me interested in the watercolors and in uh, the fact that uh, Soroya alerted Huntington, our founder, Archer Milton Huntington, not only to Hassam's uh, trip to Spain and his exhibition in 1911, but also the possibility of acquiring works and so forth. As my fellow presenter, Tim Clark has put it, a visit to Spain allows us to simultaneously live in multiple eras, different artistic epochs. This diversity is celebrated in Tim's art and indeed in the works of all the artists in the exhibition, 
in which imagery moves from late medieval uh, through Islamic, Hispano-Islamic built environments to Gothic churches, to Renaissance and Baroque facades and monastery complexes, couples of basilicas to modern city squares, as you see on the screen, full of everyday life. So very quickly, let me just run through the exhibition to remind you for those who haven't seen it. Um, one of the artists that are there with Hassam is Ernest Clifford Peixoto, a San Francisco artist of Sephardic Jewish descent who went to Spain and Portugal in 1915 and then again in 1920 and 22, showing an oil painting from La Granja and a beautiful watercolor from Avila and two works from 1915 of a procession in Avila and a, um, pre a religious precinct in Sintra in Portugal that were painted in 1915 and were so successful they were illustrated in Scribner's Magazine in 1915. We have one of the illustrations in the uh, exhibition. We also have oil sketches, not just watercolors in the exhibition because uh, Soroya's oil sketches inspired these artists. They're painted on small pochette or cedar panels and they allow the artist to go out and make sketches in oil in the countryside. You see Assam painting in Rhonda at the upper left and four works by Max Cuny, a New York artist of German descent who was active in Granada and Segovia. He was also a furniture designer. Also in the exhibition, George Wharton Edwards, who was the art editor of Collier's Magazine in the early 20th century. There you see him in 1924, uh, working towards a book about Spain that he also authored. Peixoto was also an author and illustrated his own books. Um, and this book particularly was uh, encouraged by our founder, Archer Milton Huntington. We have the Court of the Lions at the Alhambra, the Mosque at Cordova, and two views outside of the buildings, an uh, arch at Avila, a Roman arch at Avila, and a beautiful tower at Cordova in this marked magnificent impressionist composition, which is the only of our only one of our watercolors to actually find its way in the book. A great surprise was Florence Vincent Robinson, whose um, watercolors were made her famous from the 1890s into the 1930s, but is now completely unknown. Uh, Robinson also painted in the Alhambra, as you see on the left, with this very wonderful atmospheric picture catch, capturing that hot sun of the afternoon and a, a view of the Generalife Gardens, which we'll come back to later. Then there's Orville Houghton Peets, an artist from Woodstock, New York and Delaware, who Mr. Huntington sponsored. Uh, here you see a jacaranda tree embalmed in the buildings of Lisbon, and on the right, a boat in Lisbon Harbor, and two atmospheric views of the Tahoe region, one of the boats at wharf and another one of the wall of the city of Lisbon, the old city. And then there's Milan Petrovic, a Serbian born artist who came to New York in the 1920s. And in 1927, again, with Mr. Huntington's encouragement, went to Spain and Morocco. And you see here uh, three of his expressive, extremely large scale for the moment, uh, watercolors, they're well over two feet high, uh, showing a uh, Burgos, Salamanca, and the view of the Toledo Cathedral Tower. Uh, Petrovic also went to Morocco, to Tetuan and Tanger. Uh, these are two images from Tetuan, bursting with color. Again, wonderful expressive images. And of course, this reminds us that uh, Tim's works are also in the exhibition, 12, and once again, extremely large scale watercolor paintings, and I'm, I'm going to refer to them as paintings because they really are paintings the way that oil paintings are. Uh, they're large and monumental and uh, quite remarkable, both uh, uh, extremely realistic and also extremely expressive and modern at the same time. But I just wanna say now, I will return to these at the end of the program, but I just want to say now that um, Kim's experience with Hispanic culture, which of course began in Santa Ana, California, um, was uh, augmented by a great deal of travel. He uh, has traveled extensively in Mexico, for example, from 1970, as you see here on his motorcycle in Sonora uh, in 1970. And he's also visited uh, Argentina, Uruguay, made numerous trips to Spain from 1982, 
from Portugal and the Azores from 1992. And in June of 2014, when the San Diego Museum of Art presented Soroya in America uh, exhibition, over half of which was objects from the Hispanic Society, this exhibition, the Associated Symposia, and uh, um, other exhibitions of the era, uh, and uh, I might say a, a great deal of personal uh, relationships between uh, Tim and I, and the fact that Tim, who had an apartment in New York, renewed his experience with Hispanic society, um, and even made the uh, acquaintance of Blanca Ponceroya, the artist's great granddaughter and great scholar of Soroya, who suggested itineraries for him in Spain. All of this led to a new focus and, and um, understanding of his works in the Hispanic culture. I also uh, promised Tim I would mention, and I want you to look for this as you see his works going by, the influence of Hans Hoffmann on uh, his teachers in California and on uh, uh, aspects of his uh, sort of push-pull um, uh, composition and, and relationship of design to the picture play. Um, Tim, actually in 2014, uh, at the time of the exhibition, actually wrote an article uh, for Fine Arts Connoisseur magazine on Soroy. So that uh, also explains. I should quickly add that the exhibition includes dozens of works in the decorative arts of the highest level of quality in order to give context to the regions of Spain visited by the watercolor uh, artists. Now, Tim and I would like to pass on uh, to a sense of analysis of selected works in the exhibition, which we'll do as a sort of a dialogue. I'm gonna begin with these two paintings, oil paintings by Child Hassam that uh, were, uh, are in the exhibition and were painted in Spain in 1910. The one on the left is an impressionist view. Hassam is a second generation impressionist and the most important American ex uh, impressionist. This is an impressionist view of the uh, Haymarket Square in Seville. But the work on the right painted in Ronda that same year of 1910 is, is rather different. Uh, it's, of course, making ma maximum use of the stark Spanish sun, but his contemporaries commented when he exhibited it that he had lopped off the top of the Baroque tower of the exhibition. He crapped it like a photograph to the building and made it something very rectilinear and severe, emphasizing the geometry. Now, we can see this emphasis on geometry in his early, uh, his paintings right before his trip to Spain, uh, in old lime churches and so forth. And again, afterwards, uh, in, in many places, including his flag paintings with the buildings behind them, but you could see him using the trip to Spain as a laboratory to advance his art. I think Tim would like to say something about this uh, uh, view of a patio of an inn in Toledo uh, done by Peixoto. Well, we've talked about this before. They, they, he's just a, uh knows how to simplify things. And most of the painters who are in this exhibition do the same thing, but people would pay attention to the spokes on that wheel. And he, you think he's painting the wheel, but he, he's almost not. Uh, he paints the, the negative shapes, the shadows behind the spokes. He gets the spokes for free. They just like bonus. Uh, same thing happens over there on the, on the left side where they, um, they call them the shafts that attach to the horse on these carriages. He, he really has a, a middle value wash that goes down, then he puts darks on either side and he gets the shafts for free. Even the, the gentleman's shirt, he doesn't paint the shirt, he just paints the darks behind it and gets the shirt for free. This guy doesn't do a lot of work and he gets a big bonus for it. I like it. Uh, the, uh, I'm showing you here, uh, uh, Florence Robinson's view of the Henry Alife Gardens. 1920. Uh, Tim will uh, give him some more technical details, especially about the reserved white here on the fountain water. Uh, I just want to point out uh, an interesting compositional aspect for all these spots that you see here, especially around the darks, which give a shimmering quality to it, but also break up the visual field in a rather abstract way. Robinson is mostly a, a, a plein air realist painter who also uh, is influenced by Impressionism a little bit, but here she really is, is uh, working in some quite modern aspects, uh, post-Impressionist at the least, 
uh, that you might find in Maurice Prendergast. And uh, I find it interesting that she too is inspired by Spain and even the New York Times commented on how Spain uh, was, affected her style and her art and her techniques. Tim, you had some things you wanted to say here, I think. Uh, there, there's a few interesting things. She, first of all, she just stuns me uh, that I didn't know who she was. Uh, uh, her work runs runs a within a you can identify it as hers, but but the style changes and evolves a little bit. On the bottom right side, it, it's kind of a puddled watercolor with with washes almost plein air. But then as you go up, it's very controlled. It, a little, a lot like. Arthur B. Davies, those ideas may have been in the air. That fountain, the water on that fountain coming strip divides the painting exactly in half. And so it's a very balanced, formal composition that just makes everybody feel cozy. There's not, there's not, but, but then she does things that are dynamic. That white of the, it, it, you can count the values. You can count the lights to dark. It's very easy that I don't think she, put down anything to save that white. She has good control of her brush. She painted around it. And then she paints the light on top of that, that little balcony that Marcus is running the arrow on right now. And you, people say that's white, but then well, what's the water? The water is really white. So it goes one for the water, two for the roof, three for the upper sky, four for the shadow underneath the, the roof between the balconies. And then five, value five is the is the darks and the plants and she just plays with these five values in such a way that convinces you the form is strong and just delights you with the the joy of the reflection of watercolor uh petrovic to me was maybe the biggest supply a surprise of the last 20 years i, I opened a drawer in our uh, drawings uh, archives and these in these watercolors just exploded out of the drawer. Um, this is a view of the chapel, the Condestable in Burgos, uh, and of course he he's really gathering the expressive elements. The chapel itself is a, a blaze of white behind this screen of purple color, purple and brown color, with these wonderful forms of the reja, um, just almost like a a chorus singing at you, especially these spikes coming down in the dark here, and these uh, columns of the uh, cathedral, which have been turned almost into palm trees, and these green colors coming out, and this fiery uh, blue, fiery uh, uh, dynamic blue brushwork here. And something over here on the right, I hope my cursor is doing it on your screen. He, 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 we have a couple of these works by him where the cloister element is just sketchily added in a few strokes to let you know where you are. Really quite a remarkable painting. Um, moving on to Petrovic's uh, works here in Toledo, I was surprised to find after seeing works like this in his typical expressionist manner of the Alcantara Bridge, to see this very large watercolor, um, again, two and a half or more feet high, four feet wide of the uh, uh, San Martin Bridge, and so finely delineated and so carefully and delicately covered, uh, colored. Uh, I also found a pencil sketch for it here that you see was super precise. But then I learned that Petrovic, after he moved, uh, certainly after he moved uh, to uh, uh, Cincinnati, uh, most of the rest of his life, but already in Brooklyn, was an etcher, a fine line etcher. So this style that you see is his style when he's getting ready to do an etching. And that explains our analysis of it. I must say that the watercolor reminds me a little bit of Sheeler and Demuse Precisionist watercolors at exactly the same moment. Now, we come to the element of atmosphere. I'm showing you one of Edward's uh, brooding pictures of Burgos Cathedral in blue tones. Tim's wonderful image of Placencia, and then once again, Peixoto's uh, uh, courtyard. Uh, here's some more from Edwards, including this uh, image of the uh, uh, Seville uh, Palace and this outdoor, sunny, impressionist, but still highly uh, atmospheric um, image. 
uh, and then we we get to these in Orton, and he, he really almost is starting to be a, a cinema designer. I really think this could be Lord of the Rings over here, not just the San Martin Bridge. I, I, I've been in a storm in Toledo, but this is a very romantic storm, and these figures marching across the bridge, little ant-like figures, and the, the city dominating them, and then the Torre de Oro of Seville with the birds around it and something coming on. Um, all of this uh, uh, is a quality of atmosphere, but it's a quality that Tim is also a master of. And I'm hoping he will tell you something about this Guadalupe Nocturne that might surprise you. Well, thank you. It's nice to be with company with all of these great artists and, and also to be to be around the curators who, who thought so carefully on how these were all put together. But people have asked me how I did this night scene. And I did a lot of drawings off of my balcony, but then I also painted, I painted it during the daytime so I could see what the elements were. And then I got the mood of the night that I put in there and worked on the painting. And in this painting, I think, Marcus and I have spoken about this. There's a sense of rhythm that starts on the, you might say it starts on the on the left side, but then it, there's a rhythm that just flows through here. If you could follow the Marcus's arrow goes up, up to those windows and then back down as it moves across here. And then it, it centers on the main beautiful dome of the church and goes, to, so it's not just the fact that that I'm painting these. As a matter of fact, I lowered towers the the exact same way Hassam did. Uh, Hassam, I wanted didn't want any of these buildings to compete with the domed cathedral. I wanted that to be the highest part, and so I just I, I lopped off buildings. People say artists aren't powerful. Yeah, they are. They can knock a building down, and and I have a sense of rhythm that just flows through here with the mystery of the night and the mystery of that beautiful town. And that's one of the places that uh, Blanca Soroya said said she saw the earliest works that were big. The Marcus was beginning to curate, and she said, "I think if you go to Guadalupe, there'll be some magic there that will add to the show." And it certainly did. She was. You know, it's a, it's a tremendous pity that people often take day trips to Guadalupe in Extremadura. It's an incredible setting. Uh, and then they go back to Madrid or wherever they they, uh, they were staying before. And they don't stay there at night, and it really is quite a quite a marvelous place at night. Well, that's also where I I saw the the painting that became Los Borrachos. The, the a uh, uh, I saw that, and, and we were going to stay there for a couple of nights. We stayed there for four or five and then came back for another four or five the following year. But there's a, it, it's a magical, magical, wonderful place that it just feels like Spain. And there's some wonderful um, Zerberans inside their collection. It's, it's, it's a rich city. It's, it's a major collection of extant Zerberans right. in situ anywhere in the world, actually. Um, I, you know, I, I should have said when we were talking about atmosphere that that this is another very modern aspect of these watercolors, including Tim's. Uh, you know, Konstantin Stanislavski at the beginning of the 20th century enshrined atmosphere as a modernist theatrical concept and how the atmosphere that was created by the stage setting, by the actors and their relationships to each other, that atmosphere was what people went to the theater for and it became a super important part of modern dramatic uh, pedagogy and theory to this day. And these are modern artists and they are using that atmosphere. Um, Michael Chekhov, Konstantin Stanislavski's pupil and colleague talked about the atmosphere of cathedrals, the atmosphere of buildings as things affecting how you think and feel when you're around them and how the audience could think and feel. So this is also a very modern part of uh, art. Um, this work, I've had the great pleasure to see uh, Tim putting some of the finishing touches on. It's called Stepping into the Light and shows a courtyard in the Alhambra with its reflecting pool. Um, and it's uh, uh, really, uh, to my mind, uh, representative of what Tim can achieve in a work. Um, the, uh, the figures that come out of the door 
anchor us to the middle of what's a very, very complicated uh, composition as he will describe some aspects for it. The texture of this uh, part of the outside of the building with its stucco work, the shadows of the, the figures coming out of the shadow and stepping into the light. One of the motifs of this talk is going to be reserved areas in watercolors where the artist has let the white of the paper do the talking and the white of this woman's um, dress is sim symbolizing that coming into the light, but also a very important in the composition of the picture. Tim, I think I'm going to let you, uh, do you have anything to say about these details? Uh, well, what's interesting, it goes from this little, um, the little uh, oblique uh, shapes, you know, OG shapes and different shapes between each of these, they're a little different. And, and in order to make, if you really painted them full throat, the pattern would become overpowering. So it had to be kept very subtle. So I did that with some wax resist and all kinds of fun things, but I didn't think very much about it. I wanted to make sure that those helped that wall advance and the, and, and there was a smoky misty quality in the next layer and then a very dark quality in the next layer that, that accented against the figures in white uh, stepping into the light. I, I will admit that I, I hired a model when I got back to give me the, the, what I really wanted on that white figure. The white figure is an accent and the sense of humanity and scale. And I loved also how all of those elements of which I've already spoken, which had to be painted somewhat formally are contrasted by the, just the random things that happen in the water, just being able to paint that and letting, letting the, letting the watercolor have its voice and, and letting some chance happen. But people ask me how I really did this. I, I did a whole number of drawings. Now, 25 years ago, I used to be able to go into the Alhambra and get an easel license. So I could tag in a license right on my easel. The guards would come running over to throw me out and then they'd see the license and left me alone. The, the, the Ministry of Culture let me work in there, but those no longer you could do that. So. There's a little video here, I think you have, uh, showing how I drew on the inside. And the drawings don't make any sense until you step back from them. And all at once, the drawing snaps in. And I did my painting based on my drawing, which is my observation, really. So, uh, And people walking by and bothering you and everything else. Having people bother you while you're doing that is one of the great joys of painting because they... Uh, you'll you're, get to practice your Spanish a little. So, you know, in America, people go by, you know, in Spain, they, they say, que, que bonito. In France, they say, avec courage, have courage. In America, they say, my grandmother paints too. So, <laughs> so you know, you get to know the people a little, that helps. Well, this one, you were able to paint. Uh, on an easel from the motif. Right. And I, and I had done a similar composition of this years ago and, uh, and someone, someone bought it, put it in their collection. My wife said, oh, it always told me I want that again. So we went back there partly just so I could have the painting. I love this. this, tell, this scene. Tell, us where, tell us where Sahara is. It's in uh, Andalusia. Uh, it's not terribly far from, uh, from Granada. It's up in the mountains. The first time I saw it, uh, we drove up there. There was nothing, and they built a little hotel. When we came back, we stayed in that little hotel when I painted it the first time. We came back 20 years later, and the woman the woman who checked us in, I didn't think she recognized me, but she asked me about a friend who we had been traveling with 20 years before she remembered us. And it just it, the, the place feels comfortable. The, the people, the soul of the people, but also the architecture here, because Marcus and I have talk, spoken about this, the, the hilltops in the background, if you look at the hilltops with your marker, uh, the, the shape of that hilltop is perfectly echoed in the roofs of the building. They are all the same as what is referred to sometimes as organic architecture. The everything fits, everything feels right. The people feel right, the buildings feel right. And, um, and it's a sense of man and nature with harmony, which we call organic composition. Now, the one thing that breaks this is that, that Campanella, the church tower, 
uh, breaks it perfectly. And I put that break, most people would want to put that in the middle of the page, but if you're, you know, there's a, a Renaissance idea of breaking it on what we refer to as a golden section. And then there's a second break that happens. So you, you wind up with a square on one side, a rectangle on the other. The French call this a curry. They don't call it a golden section. It's a different language. And then there's a new, new square, a new square, a new rectangle, an overall rectangle. And this just gives it a formal uh, a formal breakup of the space within that repetition of theme uh, of really, you know, you could say, we've said it before in other paintings, but the, the mountains are kind of giving us da, 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 a little triangle and da, 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 da on the roofs and da, 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 and we'll do that again later if we can, but it's, it works. So Tim, it's fun. Tim, I hope, Tim, hope the celebration of that place follows my painting, my painting celebrating it. You had interesting things to say about the function of this uh, forest and its well, relationship. It, that's no different than uh, Pijoto's uh, painting the background to get the guy's shirt for free. That that forest is, and and also there's a sense of atmosphere. If you really looked at those hills and mountains behind, the the materials for the buildings are are um, are from those same hills, and so it's not just the shapes of the hills; the actual materials from the hills are are, are all from there. So. I don't know. Was there something you saw in there too that you wanted to comment? You're talking on? about the notch and the hills and the notch and the right. Then oh, I'm sorry. That's yeah. The the notch is even echoed in. But that's sometimes I you I look for things like that and exploit them if I can. I, I hope it's really there. But if not, it's, we're going to say it was. Well, uh, speaking of uh, Mexico and uh, the Baroque. Uh, there is this magnificent monumental image. Uh, this is the picture uh, led by Dr. Dunkel. And um, we, um, we have uh, now Puebla Cathedral. And I think there's a, a lot that uh, Tim might want to say about the Baroque with regard right. to this image. Well, the, this, this has a totally different structure than the last painting. The last painting was a formal golden section. This is really celebrating the Baroque. And, and the Baroque is some, sometimes when you have a subtle change from, from Renaissance to uh, Mannerist to Baroque, it happens so subtly a lot of people can't pick up on it. But when you get to full Baroque, gets easier. When, when Baroque gets to Mexico, they put hot sauce on it and you can't miss it. Everything swirls and twirls. It's like the hat dance. The whole thing goes. It's mariachis, blast, blast, and full blast. And they're, they're brilliant musicians, but the, the, everything's curving. Mar Marcus can show you that. The, the, all those C shapes that we get in the chandelier uh, and all the gold that came out of there, that, that C shape up in the chandelier, I repeat is, uh, it cut through the composition, it based on one gigantic C and there's also C, C shapes in the arches and, and you're looking up into the, the dome of the pulpit and then looking down on the pews. And it's one of those, the, those devices that I've actually borrowed from El Greco that gives you a sense of compression that makes you feel, feel, feel hugged. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. And there's a, um, Marcus has been teasing me a little bit because he's got on that I put a, that I don't think of that as a white altar cloth on the altar. I think of it as a white accent as much as anything. And that's the strong white accent, which also kind of gives it a golden section if you look across there. But then, you know, we, we, we spoke before about Beethoven. Uh, it, it, you can look at that altar cloth as da 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 da, and then you get up to the candles and da 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 things that go counter counter to them too. Again, the reserved areas of the paper, which provide the white. Right. Uh, and we have to remember the, the sparkling water in Florence Robinson and, and the other things we've talked about before. Right. Uh, it's an important aspect of the watercolor artist's arsenal. And uh, yeah. you see it mar marvelously expressed here. 
Right. And thank you. But I, you know, like on that case like that, I just painted around every one of those. And then I, then there was subtle adjustments. Some of those candles on the top, I went back and gave, you know, soften edges on them, ran subtle washes, because if they were all fully accented, it wouldn't make sense. You have to decide which ones will be accented, which ones won't. And even some of the gold on the, the that chandelier, some of it has to get turned into a dark because if you don't have some dark, the lights won't stand out. So there's, um, I, and I sat in that church for two days, uh, just drawing it the same way I did drawings at, at the, the uh, Alhambra. Um, it was easy to sit in there and draw that long because they, that was there over Christmas. And they said there was going to be a uh, pasada and they were going to actually bring real donkeys and real horses and a real baby and real everything. And I waited there for five hours and they didn't bring any, but I just drew the whole time. And so I felt like it was, I was rewarded. I think this space under here is just the most remarkable thing. Thank you. Know, you. It's going up in there. Right. And, and, and you'll see that in the Sarah Chapel, this the same kind of, a, th those are so incredible because they, they echo sound. They act like an amplifier for the priest when he gives a homily. It's not well, just a dome. Let's let's go over to Portugal to the Azores and <clears throat> briefly and look at these uh, this incredibly dynamic image um, of, of, of this monument in the Azores, uh, which uh, is also a large scale work. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it as well? Well, I was moved by it just because it's beautiful. Uh, the park in which it sits is beautiful. And the, the family who, who donated the, the land and the money to build the fountains and monuments did it all as a, um, as a monument to peace. We could sure use some. And they, uh, uh, they had a boy who, who was lost at war and they just wanted to honor him. And, uh, and so the, uh, I, I, I loved being there. I did a couple other drawings of it first. I mean, every, people talk about Sargent's uh, painting muddy alligators. And it's one of the most brilliant watercolors I think he ever did. But he did two or three others that he never showed or never sold because they, 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 um, they didn't please him. And I had the same thing happen here. I did two other pieces. I could not have done this if I hadn't had two pieces that it didn't work out. And then when I got to this, but Marcus likes this idea that there was a wing there that bothered me. It was in the wrong spot. And I, so I make it so you can see through the wing. I look through the wing and I painted it that way. And somebody says, Oh, a photograph could do it. No, it couldn't. A photograph can't see through the wings. And, uh, and the, the other thing that, that, that dark background, those trees in the distance and all kind of muted color, they, they paint most of that left side Griffin. And then as that huge dark shape has all been pulled together, gets moves across toward the right side, and then it hits that wall, it stops, that divides the painting into a golden section again. So I, you're on to me. I mean, it's a, it's a major artistic device, compositional device that began to be seen very clearly, especially first by Leonardo. So you can't give me credit for inventing that, but it, it's... Uh, you have, to, you have to know how to use it or when to use it. And I love doing that. So there's also wonderful things on that that relate to some of the pieces, that, the ceramic pieces that you have. Uh, oh, this. Here's another example of this uh, rolling focus that you have in your, your presentation of, of views of these interiors of churches. But, the, the reha here in uh, Cuenca Cathedral. Yes, well, they, they, I, I love looking up into, the, into this. The, there's a soaring spirituality um, in so many of those churches. And that I make that stairway drag you up. I mean, you, you're, you have no choice. But I also use that to slow you down. Every step is accented. Every banister is accented so that you don't just go back to there's a kind of a golden blur by the time you get back to the altar. And I like doing that. I like making the pews slow you down. And then there's a gate that they put in these 
that keeps you from getting in, you know, maybe stops vandals. I'm not sure what it is, but I just, uh, I look at that gate and can see through it. And I paint it that way. I paint it as if it slowly disappears. If you look carefully, you can see how it, it mumbles and hints as it, it, that it's there, but then eventually it just kind of mutters off into silence so you can see through there and, and look at the uh, sanctuary light. So once again, looking up and down, I borrow this compression from, um, I borrow this compression from uh, El Greco. And, and one of the things that uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Brown, a curator at San Diego, looked at this painting for almost an hour one day. He sat and he kept saying, I see more things, I see more things. And so if you get a chance to get to the museum, see if you can see some things that Dr. Burke and I haven't spoken of tonight. There's there's little things I hide in paintings that you'll have fun seeing. Well, here's another church interior. This one, uh, the gift of Betsy and Leslie Roy, showing the transparente or this uh, uh, wonderful view into heaven back behind the main altar in Toledo Cathedral. Uh, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about uh, the, the process of being able to get the image at all. Um, well, there, there's an, a rule in perspective that you can't draw beyond so many degrees. It's kind of, you need to draw with what you can see with between your hands if they go straight forward. And this was much greater than that. So the perspective has to be twisted and turned and you need to be able to use your head to, to decide that. And so uh, in the end, we a painter might learn some of those rules of perspective and, they, and there are a lot of them, but then you learn to dismiss them so that we instead pay attention to the accents that swirl you through the painting and your eye slowly climbs and goes up. Uh, in the Cuenca Cathedral, which we just looked at, I, I blew out the gates so you could look through there and get to the altar. In this case, I leave the gates in there and I just start having fun with them. There's a, a, on the gates on the left side, there's parts where I paint the dark of the wrought iron and then I reverse it. And, and when the background gets really dark, I make the wrought iron get light. And that interplay, that that switch over from dark to light reversing itself. It's just fun things for your eyes to do as they slowly climb and go up to the, the open ceiling, which uh, is kind of, that has a, an affectionate nickname, uh, Spain's window to heaven in that cathedral is just gorgeous. And there's a, a tribute to some saint on the, uh, the, the, it's the beautiful little statue. I just love painting that part. It's on the upper left side right there. And if you go there, if you go to the museum, the piece that Betsy and Les Roy so generously donated, those are the kinds of things that, that Les Roy especially loves to find. And then all at once, uh, Betsy will look over at the other side, just to their right. And there's all these figures that suddenly appear if you look at them they just emerge off the page tim, both... I, I, tim you sent me this image of you working there it, it, that's the, the choir screen around the, the main altar area behind, the, behind you and, and it really is very hard to get this view in fact i don't think a camera could get it uh it, as such we can't because i try to take a good photo and i couldn't so i had to make the painting so once again, once again, we have this very modernist element of multiple points of view. Uh, you see the altar, even though there's a screen in front of it, you see this uh, structure in a cathedral from the artist assembling it. But of course, that's what uh, Cezanne and then with more intentionality, Picasso did when they showed things from multiple points of view. It's an essential part of modern design. And once again, that's the theme of the exhibition. Right. Now we're getting closer. And to El Greco, home. too. And Al Greco, too, who was a godfather of uh, expressionism and so recognized uh, from the very beginning. By the Cubists, too. Right, exactly. So let's get a little closer to home. This is a, a California colonial image from the Spanish era, and uh, it shows the uh, Serra uh, Chapel, Serra Chapel at San Juan Capistrano. Um, here, I'm going to go to this uh, more it's, detail. That's the Thank oldest you. building in California. Uh, and, you, you, you were 
you were talking about uh, how this uh, structure in the foreground, it's a, in, more in the shadow, was built by, uh, of course, the indigenous residents uh, using their techniques, but how it functions in the inside of this church is very interesting. Could you give us some uh, enlightenment about that since you've captured it so wonderfully in this very large uh, uh, work of art, this very large painting, which is uh, nearly five feet high? It's five feet wide, exactly. And um, the, what I love is how light bounces around in there. There's a warm reflected light. There's only a, a handful of days per year where the light comes in and hits that altar. And if you're not careful, the painting will, you know, once again, you'll get pulled into that altar very, very quickly. And I love the things that the, the, the walls are, are actually tilted back in reality just and so that tilted wall that leans out on both sides gives a kind of a dizzying spirituality when it's uh, when you by the time you get to the uh, to the baroque altar the baroque altar is the it's this is the the mud walls the adobe walls here and once again as i said it's the oldest building in california but the altar itself is even older and uh, it, it came from Barcelona. And, uh, and so I use things like the accent on the window right there. The Marcus knows right where my finger is going at this point. We're, we've been a team for a long time. I use it on multiple times in the pews. I use it on the rafters and the ceiling. Uh, everything I can to slow you down so that when you finally get to the altar and get to explore, all the little, um, what are the, what are the word on those, the, uh, the, those. Estipites. Right. Estipites. Uh, right. With con muchos santos. Um, and, and they, and once again, the, uh, the, um, the pulpit with a, the, you, those are things that I love to see in Spain and paint in Spain. And, and, there's, there's, a, again, a little rendition of, Saint Teresa de Avila, and there's Saint uh, Anthony, I think, on this wall over there, coming in there, and he's half in and half out of that niche. What's the right word again, Marcus? And you tell niche, me. Niche, yeah, he's a. Well, yeah, we'll call it. Niche. But though, though, compositionally, that's known as a wedge. Every time you can wedge with a window and a shadow with a window, anything to slow you down so you don't speed through. And uh, um, there's a lot to see here. And, and I've gone back and painted variations on this oh, six, eight times. And I, I love every one of them. And every one of them comes out different. I'm afraid I'll be repeating myself. This one's kind of moody. This one's not quite finished. You can see on the right, you can see my chalk line. If you go back to the previous painting, you can see that I put in a, uh, I mean, go back to the previous slide, you can see the, um, the crucifixion. And on the left side, you can see my marks that show the process of creating it and how those parts happened. And, uh, and I loved all the debate among curators to make sure that, that, be, that that's preserved and, and, uh, and shown because once again, it, it's, um, it's a form of, of uh, a modern approach that talks about the randomness that happens in paint. Tim, I also, uh want to point out we have that reserved white again with this altar cloth, which is sort of a motif that we've seen. You're so. on to me. You didn't mention that before. <laughs> <laughs> well, finally, um, I would just like to um, uh, show this uh, a, another quite monumental image of a doorway uh, in Valencia uh, from a Rococo building from around 1750, which we exhibited with this Rococo ewer from the Alcora factory of exactly the same time as 1740 to 60, uh, with the Rococo lines in it. Um, but I think you have some other elements in this composition you want to share with our listeners as a closing comment for this uh, this uh, tertulia. Well, you know, as I said earlier, as you go through Spain, the the architecture is so stunning from one building to the next. And, and the architecture was built to make people feel a certain way, to either make them feel stable when, uh, when you see the squared off pieces or you see the, um, the, the way I painted the, 
the 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 building that was in harmony with nature that's a renaissance approach this is nothing like it you can't help but understand that this is is really baroque and it spins and it turns and some people say oh there's an s curve it's even more than an s marcus will follow with that little arrow going through there if you don't mind he'll just follow from accent to accent going down across the angels and going there. And somebody said oh it's kind of, it's it's really almost like a maytag agitator that's going to clean everybody's laundry that thing is spinning and churning and telling everybody to be excited and be happy and and to um to celebrate the goodness of life. And that's what it's all about. And it's fun to paint those kinds of things. And it's fun to live with these because they, they, they make you either feel stable if it's a stable piece that I'm celebrating or makes you feel the, the and this is a very narrow state space, but we're still playing things that are going back and forth within that space. We're controlling what we call controlling the picture plane. And, um, and for you to pick up on that and see it was an honor. Well, I know uh, our time is nearly up and we want to leave some time for questions, but thank you, Tim, for this remarkable insight into your works and into the works of the other artists in the gallery. Here, I'm showing you a gallery view. Remember, it is going to be on exhibit through this month and through October 16th, uh, Thursday through Sunday from noon to 6 p.m. And now, Laura, do we have some questions? Yes, Marcus, one of our viewers um, want to know what watercolor paper does Mr. Clark use? Oh, <laughs> it's great that somebody asked that. You know, when, you, when I started out well over 50 years ago, you know, well, I used whatever I could afford, but then pretty soon there, there were some standard French papers that almost everyone used, but I didn't want that. I wanted my own look. I wanted my paintings to look like mine. It's kind of like when George Harrison came out with a 12 string Rickenbacker guitar and Ringo Starr banged a, a cowbell on I Call Your Name. They got, he got his own sound very firmly in there. And from that, they were able to explore. And, um, and at some point by using a variety of papers, I got my own look. And um, I actually, I like, I'm gonna make one more rock and roll analogy. Keith Richards, once they asked him, what's your favorite guitar? He said, you give me any of them and I can make them all sound the same in 10 minutes. He can make it, cause he has his own sound. And so eventually you, it, it, working on a wide variety of papers and I have drawers and drawers full Whichever one I feel like I, when I go through, I look at them and I see. But the um, uh, working on a wide variety of papers helped me find out the one way I want to paint. You know, the one way it, it still varies, but it gives there's a, a look of mine as I explore different things. I don't. Does that does that um, answer that for the viewer? I hope. I think so. We have one last question. And it's what attracted you or brought you to Spain and Mexico? Well, it's funny. I, I, I was born in Southern California and my mother had taught uh, Spanish speaking children in, in grade school. And, um, and, and so the, there were enclaves, little barrios, and they're still, they're still there uh, through every decent sized city in, in California. And I, I went into those and, and embraced the culture, was really curious. And, and I watched my mother um, uh, speak a number of languages. And, uh, and so I, I, was, I was hungry to go. And, I was, and, you know, things like the food, even the, uh, the, the uh, there are a couple of paintings that we didn't have room for, but, you know, we had a kitchen the the way the there's a baroque quality the way I paint kitchens and I even painted the dirty sinks in some of the restaurants I had four paintings Marcus wouldn't let me put in I said we ah. could call it the Quattro Cinco series and Marcus <laughs> didn't didn't uh, wouldn't let me do that the Quattro the, the Quattro Cinco I wish we had an audience to find out if they're laughing yes they're, they're hissing um, no we. <laughs> It was really a matter of wall space, and uh, I didn't hear that. It was a matter of wall space. We only had. I understand. Wall. No, and, uh, but but 
the the these works uh, were part of this much wider uh, cohort of, uh, of of works of, of these Hispanic themed that that is now in Tim's Irv, uh, and um, and, the, and so that that they are available for the future, and we uh, we look forward to much more of this, not only from Tim but from other artists who we hope this exhibition will inspire even as our Vilcek fellows, contemporary artists working in the uh, Hispanic society now, and the artists that we've, in, the various artists we have invited to put things out on the, uh, the, the plaza, the terrace, and that's gonna continue really quite magnificently in the next uh, couple of years. So that uh, as we slowly reopen, uh, this kind of interchange between contemporary art and the art uh, of, of previous artists and the works of art at the Hispanic Society uh, will continue and will become, uh, as it has been now for 118 years, an important part of what is going on in the art world in New York City. So anyway, I thank you again, Tim. Uh, thank you, all, Laura, everybody. If I believe we're uh, out of time. Is that true? Um, yes, we have four more minutes. Marcus. So if there are no, are there no more questions from the audience? Does anyone else would like to ask something? Um, may I give one more answer? You may. <laughs> the, no. the, the other, the, you know, the, the richness, the art school where I went, Orozco came and taught mural painting. I mean, they, the, the culture was everywhere. And it, there was an Orozco mural in the room where I learned how to really draw it was behind a. It was hidden behind a wall, but I think it was spiritually still there. My love of of Velasquez and Goya and Soroya, all of these great masters. There, there's a continuum, and you try to say, how can I do do it my way with a little vision which still honors the past, and um, and so it's all exciting. And when I when when I saw of the Velasquez show at Grand Palais a couple of years ago, I, I thought what an honor it would be to, to be curated that way. And next thing I know, Marcus, who was one of the curators there and Guillaume, who was the chief curator on that, are, are handling these works. And so I wanna thank all the curators and the trustees and everybody that was involved with this. It's just, uh, it's wonderful to celebrate and be part of the celebration of Spanish art, so I thank you. Uh, mentioning Guillaume Keenst, our new director, um, I would once again like to thank him for encouraging us to put the decorative arts in the exhibition, which I think all of you will, when you go to the gallery, find a, a, a very important part of the artistic experience. So again, let me thank you for joining our tertulias uh, on Hispanic art subjects. And we'll have another on the first Tuesday of October. Uh, and we hope all of you will be there then. So good night. <laughs>